Hi, welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, I'm a programmer at TIFF now, and this is the other thing I do. Also, TIFF is now. My guest this week is VT90, a Toronto filmmaker whose first feature, This Place, stars Devery Jacobs and Priya Guns as young women from very different backgrounds whose budding relationship is complicated by the baggage they carry, and to a lesser extent, by the city in which they live. It's an intimate, piercing drama with tremendously affecting performances, and it makes its world premiere this Friday, September 9th, at 8.45pm at the Scotiabank 3. I've also been able to program it in the Festival at Home digital series, and it'll be available there on digital.tiff.net at 10 a.m. Wednesday, September 14th. You should see it. Ninety pick 10 Things I Hate About You, the Disney high school update of Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew that stars Julia Stiles as prickly Cat Stratford, the terror of Padua High, and Heath Ledger as the charismatic ruffian Patrick Verona, who's enlisted by Cameron James, played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, to woo Cat so that Cameron can date her younger sister, Bianca, played by Larissa Olenek. Naturally, Patrick's overtures are rejected, sparking a war of wills that will consume the entire school, Shakespeare style. But don't worry, this is one of the comedies, so everything works out. This is someone else's movie. I actually have never seen it in a movie theater. I've only seen it on TV or on my computer screen. <laughs> Were you part of the, the army that was just waiting for it to hit DVD no, and jump right I, on it? Honestly, the first time I saw it was on television. Maybe I was 12, 13, I think. So I didn't experience it. I mean, I've, I'd heard about it. My dad was like, he would take us to movies on Tuesdays or on the weekend, but usually Tuesdays, especially in the summertime. And we go up to Fairview Mall and <laughs> watch it for half price. And I, I saw other movies. Like I convinced my dad to see other teen movies. Like I saw You Drive Me Crazy, which was Sabrina the Teenage Witch was a big. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Uh, so I dragged him to see that. We saw Matilda. Like we saw a lot of movies, but that was one movie that we didn't see in the movie theater. I had heard about it. My cousins had talked about it. Um, I seen images of Heath Ledger and like fell in love in my like child self, my 10 year old self falling in love with Heath Ledger, but I didn't see it until I saw it on television on my television screen. Yeah. I don't even remember what channel it was, but it was something and I was watching it on TV. Did you watch it from the beginning? Did you stumble onto it while it was underway? Like, what is it like to be smacked by Heath Ledger's charisma? The first time I stumbled onto it, but very like early in the movie, I cannot remember what point I didn't watch the whole thing. Then, then whenever I would see it on like, I don't know, the TV has changed so much, but the TV guide of sorts, I would like find it and I would try to watch it from the beginning because I was um, addicted to TV. My brother and I watched a lot of TV. It was like our babysitter. Um, <laughs> but Heath Ledger, oh man. I mean, first of all, rest in peace, like just gave us so much. And I think for a generation of um, young folks and I, across gender spectrum, I think people just loved him. And I think it was the accent. I feel like I hadn't heard that accent before at that age and the hair. I mean, it changed so much over time and just, I don't know, there was such a command for him, even at a, as a kid, I'm talking, I was a kid and I was assessing it like a grown up. But I, I think I, when I look back at my child self, I just feel like, or my preteen self, I feel like that was an example for me of like such a command of like the screen. He just felt comfortable. And I rewatched it. I rewatched it a hundred. I mean, I've watched a hundred times. It's one of those movies that I can watch a bazillion times. And I think every time I'm just like, wow, he just looks so comfortable on screen. Like I buy it. I didn't, you know, I think him, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, I love like Larissa Olenek, who I knew from other shows, but it was really Heath Ledger. Like it was just such a groundedness on screen, even for a teen comedy, a, like romance comedy. <laughs> Yeah, I'd seen him in a couple of Australian films already at that point, but or maybe I didn't actually. Am I thinking of no, he'd done television or something, right? Um, I think he'd done TV. I didn't know anything before that, but when I, because I love to do a deep dive on Wikipedia, I'm a deep dive Wikipedia YouTube person, and I can spend hours doing that. And I'm pretty sure he had done TV before that. Yeah, he was in an Australian film called Two Hands that I want to say played at TIFF, but I could be wrong about that. Okay. Uh, but it followed 10 things. It was the same year, but it, 10 things came out early in okay. the year and, and um, two hands came out later. But I, I remember I went to the press screening, like it was a public yeah. preview screening at the Silver City Young and Eglinton with like 300 radio contest winners. Uh, and we were all just sort of grumbling because oh, Shakespeare rework, that's never going to be a good idea. And everybody was just sort of 
down and then it started and within two minutes with a little joke about what cat's listening to versus what everybody else is listening to it just derails it instantly and and sort of reassures you that everything like you're in good hands and then by the time patrick is singing on the uh in the bands in the um in the bleachers the whole room is crackling it's like this is what it was like to watch julia roberts in pretty woman like you're oh. watching a movie star happen happen yeah i mean you know i actually when i was younger obviously i wasn't reading a lot of shakespeare so when i I, everybody has that english teacher right i think there's like tweets every year that come up about it i mean like everyone has that teacher i remember watching um uh quinta brenton talk about her teacher and creating abbott elementary we always have that like significant teacher that like guides us at a certain point and Mm -hmm. i uh, miss Parrish, who was my 10th grade english teacher and she was like you know really picking things from the curriculum that like they were in there, but they weren't being picked by other English teachers. Like we read their eyes were watching God, you know, I think like she was just introducing us to stuff that normally wasn't introduced to a lot of students in the Toronto Edition School Board. And she was the first person to say, this is the best adaptation of Taming of the Shoe that has ever been made. And I was like, I don't want to see me of the shoe. Like I, and then she's like, it's a Shakespeare, you know? And so I just remember that was a pivotal moment. I remember watching in class. She had us watch it in class because she wanted us to watch something that was kind of relatable. Mind you, it was like, this came out in 90, 1999. That was like 2003. So it had been some time, but yeah. I just, I, I credit her for like making space for that in in like high school English class in like Fleming Park and in the hood in Toronto like it was just such a wonderful experience and um and I still loved Heath Ledger I was still in love (laughs) oh god yeah I mean we just (laughs) he's somebody I never got to interview him we bumped into each other in a hallway during I think it was the year Candy was here but I mean I I've met him I had met him uh and he's just like this he was, uh, my only memory of him were the cheekbones and the grin and just how warm he was. And then she's sort of go, hey, hi, mate, and walk past in the, like, just a just yeah. a nice guy on his way to an interview. And um, and then I did the, uh, I'm going to bring it down for a minute. I yeah. did the Dark Knight Junket in LA, uh, and that was probably the most depressing Saturday afternoon of my entire career, uh, just because there was this one idiot in my round table who kept wanting to ask, who kept asking every single guest if Heath Ledger died because, and I quote, he was possessed by the Joker. It's just this, this guy wanted that story and would not give it up. And, you know, everybody associated, and you could just see how much pain it caused everybody who was being asked. Like Christian Bale was trying to talk him out of it. And Maggie Gyllenhaal was just like, oh, don't do that. And, um, you know, Nolan, Christopher Nolan has no idea how to respond to something like this other than to say like, to, you know, we captured his performance and that's all you need. And then Gary Oldman, who I thought was going to hit him, uh, ended up just turning on a dime and saying, no, 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 no. He was a lovely man. He wasn't possessed by anything. He, we, he was an actor. He would, you know, we would look at pictures of his children and smoke cigarettes between takes. And it's horrible that he's gone. And just this beautiful, I, I ended up writing the whole thing that became the focus of the story, but I think that was the first time since the news of his death that I realized just how, like how much of a rotten accident the whole thing was. It just, it wasn't an, it was an accidental overdose of medication. It wasn't anything deliberate. He was, he was in pain, but not like that. And yeah. And then you go back and, and then you rewatch something like this. And, and it was the same thing that happened when, you know, like when David Bowie died, the music won't let you be sad. So yeah. you can just immediately click back into how much fun he's having in this film and how uh, 10 things, not the dark Knight, but he was having fun in that too. But, but uh-huh. he just brought so much to this role and you know, it's a Shakespeare adaptation. This role has been played by literally thousands of people, but I think he's the one, like he's the guy I think of when I think about Taming of the Shrew now. Yeah, he, I, 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 you know, it's 10 things I hate, but I think there's three memories for me. Like, of course, he's made incredible work over, t- he had made incredible work over time. 10 things I hate about you was my introduction to him. And I just, it was a crush, but it was also captivating as someone who loves cinema and television and has, you know, since childhood and grew up with parents who loved cinema. I think I just, you know, I grew up on a lot of South Indian cinema. So that was my sure. reference point. A lot of like Mani Ratnam films, socially like conscious, just social justice films, social themes. And so, you know, there were amazing actors that I watched growing up outside of like a North American context. And I think he had the kind of like weight, I, I guess. I don't know if there's another way to say it, even in like 
this like romantic, sweet, like cheeky kind of role, there was a weight to him and and I felt it. And I think the second time I remember like seeing him in a theater and I actually, this is a story I told the other day, which I, I feel really bad about is that like, I went to see Brokeback Mountain with some high school friends and we cut school <laughs> <laughs> because we loved, we loved both of those actors and sure. I with friends who, and at the time, you know, didn't have the language around homophobia or anything else and had a friend who had been outed in high school. And, you know, I, I was in the theater and they were all like, Oh, we're leaving. Like we can't watch this. And I was like, I'm, why, why does everyone want to leave? And we all took the bus together. We were all expected to take the bus back by our parents. And I, and I left the theater because I was with people who were uncomfortable and were wrestling with whatever feelings they were wrestling with. I can't say for sure I'm not them, but I remember watching that film and being like, the thing that I remember about him was there's just such a tenderness and, and, and weight to him that shows up in every role, even, even in the Joker, you know, and I, I'm not going to say that lightly, but there's, those elements show up because I think that's in his eyes and his heart as an actor. And the fact that he was able to bring that to those three and so many other roles is, is why people love that. And he's one of the people that I was like, when I think like, like so many others, when we heard the news of his passing, it hit, like it hit, like it's someone, you know, I think I felt that about other folks, maybe Chadwick Boseman, you know, growing up watching a lot of his stuff over time, but there are a few actors that I feel that way about and Heath Ledger is definitely one of them. And I think both of them actually carry that kind of weight and tenderness that is, that's shared. That was what resonates with people. Yeah. There's something about Boseman. Yeah. Boseman does have it. It's like, it's not a playfulness exactly, but it's a no. willingness to be played with. Yeah. Like he makes us partners yeah. in the stuff that he's doing. And yeah. Boseman, I mean, even when he did the James Brown movie, which you know, the one time it, he looks at the camera is after he's he's assaulted his wife. It's the only time he makes contact with it. And it's a use of that thing that he has where the charisma is yeah. just turned off for a second and you get to see how awful this is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. They have a laugh. Like, they, they, there's there's always a look. It, it, you know, it could be with Bozeman when he's looking at Shuri and his sister and making jokes or, or even Heath in this in 10 Things I Hate About You when he just, like, gives Julia Stiles that look. And it, they, they have that look. And that's the look of a leading a leading character that just is here with us to stay forever. Yeah. It's also so incongruous too with him because his voice is so deep and his body is so easy. Like he moves yeah. so lightly. <laughs> it's just this great conflict where he doesn't sound yeah. like you think he's going to sound. And yeah, then when he starts- You expected him to be either like they, the opposite, you expect the opposite of each, each part of him and you're like, wait, this is not adding up, but it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It does. It does. And we cannot discount- Julia Stiles either because yeah. she she is the lead of the film like, yeah. as much as Ledger sort of takes it away from her of course yeah. simply by showing up she it's like it's Kat's story yeah and it's still my favorite role of hers to date I think like nothing can top the way we were introduced to her or like you know on a on a wider level is that movie I think she just <laughs> she that she really embodied I don't know if it was like a result of like being young and like you know getting your first chance and having nobody's expectations. I have no idea what it was, but she fully embodied that. And I, I related to her. Like I, I wasn't as angsty outside, but I was inside and I was with my family, I guess no one else saw it, but um, she was messy and like, and confrontational and out loud in a way that I couldn't be. And I, of course, like, you know, I love the line with Mr. Morgan where He's like, you know, oh, must have been hard, like suburban middle class upbringing, like tell me about your challenges. And so I, I recognized very early on that she and I were not the same person, but yeah. we, we, maybe she could be loud in a reason that a way that I couldn't be or I didn't feel like I could. But I felt seen. I definitely I felt both equally her and Bianca. Like I I think I felt like I was and I think Bianca's trajectory, you know, or changes through the film, I in you know coming into herself in a very particular way I was like oh I feel like Bianca but inside of me there's Kat <laughs> yeah it's funny nobody doesn't connect to Kat and yeah. she's supposed to be off-putting right that's the thing that the, the the little tweak I think that comes to the film from the play which is that so often um she's not allowed to be funny or she's funny to herself like she's amusing herself the way that she has to because no one else respects her or cares for her. But here, like Kat Stratford's awesome. 
she oh. she listens to cool bands <laughs> she's uh she's eccentric enough that she understands how people see her and she uses it against them and she's just she's in control without ever being the shrew from the play which i yeah. found really really interesting because in the back of my mind it's like well that's not right <laughs> And right, Petruchio yeah. is an asshole and, and Kate's a monster and that's why they get together. And it's like, no, yeah. these are children. They're young children and they're experimenting with these personas. And Kat has every reason to be the yeah. way she is. Um, but then every time you see her at home with her family, especially with like Larry Miller as her father, just that whole get the belly thing, <laughs> you understand why she is who she is in a way that the play doesn't allow because yeah. they're, they're fully formed characters by the time the play starts. And I this is just nuance. Yeah. I just love that. Like she is a teenager. And so like, I was that teenager who was like, I don't need a date guy. I, they suck. I'm just, I, all my friends were dating and it wasn't that I wasn't allowed to, or maybe I wasn't, I don't know. Like we never talked about it in my house, but <laughs> um, like, I was like, I don't want to date these dudes that I go to school with. And like, you know, and but there was a persona or performance I had in it. And and at the same time, like dudes aside or guys aside, like, or others aside, I just also deeply crave like attention and tenderness. And, and that, that is so relatable with Kat because when she receives that and like someone makes her feel, you know, like a good friend or a good partner, whoever it is that you're close to, and they make you feel say a, a semblance of safety and ease and and care you you open up who regardless of who it is and and I think she spoke to that part of us that even though like we're angsty and we're angry and we have all these feelings we also like I think as humans so, like deeply want to be loved in whatever that looks like for us you know yeah and it is I mean there isn't a lot of or, or any actually now that I think about it there's no real it, there's nothing in the film that isn't heterosexual like straight up heterosexual <laughs> but it's still so open-hearted mm -hmm. that that it hasn't dated in the way that a lot of the films produced around that time was i mean there's no queer baiting there's nobody who's who's shunned or mocked for being different i guess because cat is different from the outset that just sort of gives them the the, the buy on that to just move forward but it has held up so much better than i thought it might have it's been like 24 years yeah, that's wild. And I think about like, I mean, but I think that's also it. like it's held up. And I think like the way characters, even in the film, like I go back to Mr. Morgan or even Miss Perky, like they, the way they kind of make fun of or like challenge Cat also, I think, adds to the film and adds to like, she's weird, but there's other people who also challenge her angst and her angriness and where does it come from? And you kind of see both sides of it. You see her dad with Larry Miller, you see her at home and you're like, oh yeah, my dad was doing that, that I'd be upset too. And, but at the same time, you, you know, when you have Mr. Morgan and Miss Perky and just like those around her challenging her, you're also like, yeah, I mean, you might be a bit much sometimes. And like, there's a balance there. And I think like there is commentary or people checking her and then she checking people as people are checking her. And I think that's really important. Like, I think that's I, uh, Kiwi Smith did a great job in that. I think made it a complicated character that even though she feels righteous, in everything she's doing, there are people who are like, mm, you can settle down a little bit. It's not, you don't have the worst life out there, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. I mean, they, by the time we catch up to them, they're all kind of tired of it. Like yeah. they, they've, I, I yeah. And, and uh, again, Miss, of course, Allison Janney is Allison perfect Jan in that role, right? Like you, <laughs> you look back and it's like, oh yeah, nat naturally there was a point in time where Allison Janney was playing small walk-on parts, yeah. but, but she does have this little, there's a little twist in her performance that says, I know you're not in trouble, yeah. right? Like, I'm just a little tired of you. Yeah, yeah. And just like her at her desk type, like, I I mean, as a, you know, as a child, I was like, what is she talking about? And then as a teenager, I was like, oh my God, she's talking about that. Now I'm like, that's hilarious, you know? So <laughs> even the transition of like you said, like 24 years, like I watched it as a kid, I watched it as a teenage, like I, I watched it throughout my life, so to say, like as a child, uh, a teenager, you know, someone in my 20s who thinks she's got it all figured out. Now I'm in my 30s and I'm like, it's still great. Like, and I love that I've watched it in, you know, three separate decades of my life. I think that's really special. <laughs> that's great. I mean, I was in my, wait, I, no, I was just about, I was 29 when I first saw it. Okay. And it played for me. And, you know, that's, I'm a good 11 or 12 years out of high school. And I still painfully recognize myself in Joseph Gordon-Levitt. 
Um, did he? Okay. Yeah. He told me that once I interviewed him for, we did a cover. Okay. And one of the things that didn't make it into the piece was just like people still come up to him and say, Cameron James. And he's like, I know, I know. <laughs> you were me in high school. <laughs> Uh, and he says it's because he's his 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 idea of it was like he was non-threatening but longing, and right. so he's able to express romantic feelings and yeah. be completely harmless. Yeah. Right. Because the whole point of it is he has no power. His like Cameron cannot move forward, yeah. and is therefore not a threat to anyone. Um, so he's like he's ultimately as close to a villain as the whole thing has because he sets the scheme in motion. Right. But he's coming from a pure place. Yeah, but we also want him to win at the end too. Like exactly. we want them all to win, and we don't like we're not. Yeah, that's true. I never was like mad at him. Like I, I think there was a level of like, oh, that he did it, not understanding it fully, but being like or new the nuances of, but he did it for a reason, and it sucks, and now everyone's upset, but everything's gonna work out. Like I just remember when I was a kid, I was watching, I was like, I'm not mad at him, but damn, like damn, you shouldn't have done that, and now look what's happening. But like I want you to win too. <laughs> And I want you all to be happy. And I think that that was a beautiful part for me is that, yeah, he was as close to a villain, but he wasn't a villain because he still was a human who was trying to be loved too. <laughs> yeah. And even, I mean, if you go back to The Taming of the Shrew, the source text, like Catherine is the villain and she's absolutely not here because we under, we're on her, like we open with her, we're on her side. Mm -hmm. the, the smartest thing the movie does is just make the men, the interlopers that they always were, mm -hmm. but in the play it's the two of them conspiring about how they're going to win these women and 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 take them and run away with them or whatever it is that they had planned that Shakespeare couldn't write about at the time but but by making them like virginal teenagers it takes all the teeth out of it and it makes it safe as yeah. opposed to something like what was the other one the one Amanda Bynes she's the man which, oh, she's the man. Yeah, yeah, I watched it once. That's one that I haven't watched more than once. <laughs> no, it does not. I mean, there's stuff in it that's great. It's Bynes great. is having a lot of fun and yeah. Channing Tatum, amazing yeah. physical comedian even then. But yeah. you, you just look at it now and you're just like, ooh, really? That's yeah. that's awkward. And yeah. it's just Twelfth Night. I mean, yeah. they did that. Yeah. But this found exactly the right way to land it. And I'm just, you know, it's it's a television film uh, director um, making his first feature, I think, Gil Younger, who worked on yeah. Ellen DeGeneres' show a lot. And mm -hmm. I had no idea that um, that he could handle something with this sensitivity. And it's but it's written by the people who made who would go on to write Legally Blonde and Ellen Enchanted, neither of which, mm. to my mind, has held up. I mean, I know a lot of people love Elle Woods, but <laughs> this is I the one know, that I come back to. I speaking the wrong person. It's held up for a <laughs> but I get it not maybe not 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 I think collectively uh, across audiences I think it has its audience legally blonde mm. well enchanted I I mean I'm that kid like I I still love my other when I was thinking about what we would talk <laughs> about my two options when I I told my friend Eddie I was like it's either the princess diaries or 10 things I hate about you for me and he was like I mean that's you so it makes sense like oh you know I think like <laughs> go for it like you know, do what you got to do. I was telling everyone and everyone's like, just go for it. And so I decided 10 things I hate about you, but I, I could have easily done, I'm an Hathaway Hive, so I could have done that. Um, oh, she was great in that movie. I, that and movie. She, you know, just Julie Andrews being her, her mom figure, there's That's her it. grandmother, but there's, there's no downside. And I'm, I'm speaking as someone who got hives from almost every Gary Marshall movie. <laughs> um, just come on, man. But, uh, Rest in but peace, yeah, man. like Ella Enchanted of that time. Yeah, I mean, those are, I am that audience. So I don't know. I don't know if I'm the right person. I love all those movies. Um, but uh, that there's just something about this one that it just holds up in a really particular way. And it's like, no matter who I talk to, they've seen it. They love it. Like, I am a rom-com girl. I am like a teen comedy kid. Like, you know, still at 34, you know, I'm, I am. <laughs> I love a good, like, cheesy corny otherworldly kind of love story and even if it's based in stark reality and I think this one is one of the rare ones where I can talk to a lot of people about like I, I, I Princess Diaries not always going to work you know across the board or even She's the Man or any of those movies that I love but this one I can talk to a lot of people about and have a conversation which I love. Hey, it's Norm interrupting my own show to tell you about the latest Shiny Things newsletter, my weekly dispatch about physical media, culture, and the odd streaming thing. 
This week, I wrote about Prime Video's clever reboot of A League of Their Own, the new Criterion editions of Faya Dai and Hotel du Nord, and Shout Factory's gorgeous 4K box of Mamoru Hosoda's Bell. Subscribe for the price of a latte at shiny-things.ghost.io or find a link at the Simcast Twitter account. Did you miss me writing about movies? I did. Come check it out. Hello. One of the other things I just wanted to say was when I saw your D- your Blu-ray copy, I just love that poster. I'll never forget the image of that poster. I think like just seeing her there sitting like a like a queen dom and him just like leaned over. I think it's also an iconic poster. And it does tell you everything right away that he's just a goofus and has no idea what to do. And and again, deconstructing this the the Shakespeare right away as well yeah. by having no illusions about whether someone will be tamed or not, right? Like at no point does yeah, at no point does he break her. At no, no. point does the play play out, which I think is the same again, it's it's the saving grace, but also it's just sort of an acknowledgement of just how good hearted these kids are. Yeah. I love that. I love at the end, one of my I'll say the last thing is like at the end where like, you know, she does her whole these are the, the hate, I hate this, I hate this. And he finds her outside and the guitar's in the car and and he comes up to her and they're talking. He mentions the tambourine and like her a drum kit. There's always something else to get her. And she and he he kisses her and then she tries to like start she's like, don't think that and he just pulls her back in and you're like it's so beautiful because it's some you it was a really beautiful depiction of someone loving or caring for you in this for who you exactly are and not trying to change you and at the same time you giving a little and allowing yourself to be loved and I think it was like a really beautiful example of like letting your guard down but not changing who you are yeah yeah Yeah. nobody changes for anybody they accept each other on their own terms and maybe you know things are going to work out and maybe they're not they're in high school it doesn't matter like it's not about true love although i'm pretty sure they're going to make it like there's a there's a reality in my mind where heath ledger you know just got to stick with julia styles those Me people too. are still together and everything is fine and that's yeah. that's what i want from my movie i yeah. i just want <laughs> yeah i want cat and patrick together forever and raising children who get their own shakespeare story that has nothing to do with with theirs <laughs> I'd love to see it. If someone wants me to direct it, I'm here for it. <laughs> I would watch that. Uh, the other thing I find absolutely fascinating before we um, before we move on entirely is that it was shot by Mark Irwin, who is Cronenberg's guy. Like he's oh, he, I didn't even know that. Hold on, what? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, was, you're right. I'm looking oh, at yeah. the IMDb Pro, and I see. It. I remember wow. seeing the the credit and just going, "What?" Uh, yeah, he made like he shot everything up to. I think up to the fly, and then Sushiski came on for Dead Ringers, uh, and then he still did genre stuff. Like he made, I've got it here. He shot The Blob and Fright Night Two, and yeah. you know RoboCop Two and Passenger Fifty Seven, and then somehow, oh, he also made the Mighty Duck sequel, and maybe that's what got him into Disney's orbit. But he has this really bizarre transition in the mid '90s where he's making Dumb and Dumber and Kingpin and Scream. Oh yeah, but he did do. There's something about Mary. I just yeah. see the year before. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then he just became that guy, and he hasn't made a horror movie since. I don't think. No. It's such a oh, strange he, place to end up. Myself and Irene. Okay, Osmosis Jones. Yeah, but you're, I didn't know this. This is. Thank you for fun fact. I had no idea. He did Blonde Ambition. All right. Yeah, no, he was like he was a go-to guy for bright, sunny comedies, and I'm thinking this was the thing that did it. Well, maybe Dumb and Dumber, but you yeah. know, there's a there's a point where all of a sudden he's making movies that don't look anything like the the horror films he made. And RoboCop Two, I remember being struck by how shiny and chrome it is compared to how kind of gritty the first one was. Right. And that was yeah. a deliberate decision on the director's part. He wanted it to look like a car commercial, right. but Margaret could do anything, and here he is making this goofy little Disney movie but then I noticed the color scheme is interesting and like there's stuff to look at all the Um, time yeah it's beautiful I think it's like for a teen comedy that has like you know certain ways that they always kind of look I think there's something specifically striking about this I don't know what it is but it pulls me in and it's more interesting visually than I think most uh, attempt to be I guess yeah, I mean, you could have just gotten off on the cheekbones and the uh, and the bone structure of everybody on this <laughs> film, but now there's a little bit more. And also the little pairings are great, too. Like, the mm-hmm. way that 
Gordon Levitt and Larissa Olin, it kind of do look like they're meant for each other. They've got yeah. these cylindrical, smooth faces yeah, and the big, right. like, they're very petite in the movie at that age. Yeah, yeah. And even just like the friendship pairings are really interesting. Like, I was one of, I mean, Gabrielle Union was doing like all these kind of like part, you know, bit roles and friend, or you know, she was also in uh, Love and Basketball, which yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. like come in and you know, she was all, I'm so happy to see her in a role, but I'm like, wow, you just. You have an age, number one. <laughs> you just look the same. But like just seeing um these people who now have had these long careers that have gone in all these different directions and it's exciting. Like it just it feels so much a part of my life, this movie. I don't know what else to say. I couldn't be further from my life, but it feels like it's part of my life. It's nice. Yeah. And so we can talk about how you know, or what of what of your life has informed your own work? Uh, yeah. Usually, the the pivot on the podcast is with I ask somebody how or if the movie they're talking about has has been part of or, or has influenced their own work. I'm not seeing a lot of contrast. I'm not seeing a lot of connections between Ten Things and, and this place. <laughs> but there is a sense of stories having started before we get there. Yeah. Uh, and that's like the the characters are informed by their pasts, and that becomes a, a crucial aspect of your film. But in a way that that's the only thing I can connect it to. Oh well, I would say like when I look at this place, like the you know the two characters, I keep I'm like I kind of want to do like online poll, like are you a Yosta or are you a Malay? And I think Yosta I think is the part of me that people see maybe, and then Malay is like you know the things that I am, and I think Malay is that kind of. She's not easy to love. Like every, you know, we did test screening. She's not everybody's favorite. I think it's easy to love Devry as Yosta, but I think the way Priya chose to play Malay and the way she's written is, she's just, I think she's a lot less likable maybe on the page. And I think Priya Gunn's brought this kind of sensitivity to her, but she is of like the cat world, right? Like she is, you know, she's, she feels responsible for things. She feels, you know, she's a little bit different. I think she might be a bit softer and, maybe a bit quieter but she is that kind of against the grain different from like other girls in her community different from other girls her age and I think that trajectory of like she follows in that trajectory of like the cat characters who are not like these neatly packageable nice girls who you know she's not a Bianca (laughs) it's not it you know and um, I think I'm I'm most interested in those characters they might not always look like cat but I think like characters who come to be some version of cat or are coming of age into that kind of angst and 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 willingness and openness to being upset and angry about things and confronting those things um is malay so and malay is so much of me <laughs> i think it's like you know people who know me well hear the dialogue and they're like that sounds like 90 and so um i think it is there right and it's a love story and at the end of the day like i love a young love story i think i didn't realize which is funny because i was a late bloomer and i was really in the fantasy world of things but um and movies were my escape and i dreamt of what love could look like through the movies and tv but yeah i think malay is a version of cat in another universe and i think it's hard to see but in my mind she's there because those are the characters that i found most interesting in that that informed me yeah, I'm really curious to see how it plays with an audience. I just, I know it's going to be like moving and and quiet and unsettling. Yeah, and it's just so it's so hard to watch a film, you know, by myself and imagine how other people will respond to it as a great big group. Yeah. But I, I was so glad to see it when I did see it. You know, I, I I tried to go in as cold as possible, and someone said, "Oh, take a look at this." Devery Jacobs is in, it. and immediately I'm like, "Okay." Yeah. <laughs> um, because like Devery's amazing, amazing. <laughs> in everything. Yeah. But then you like it's a two hander. Right, yeah. It's not up to her to just carry it. There's yeah. so much there's so much going on between both of them and, and yeah. the sense of isolation in the way that like when people have asked about it, I've been saying like it's a film about how who you are informs what you do, which sounds reductive, right? Because that's yeah, that every every movie, but it really is about who they are. That was our goal. Yeah, that was our goal when we were writing and talking it through, you know. Um, you know, Goshan said this, or one of our co-writers said this really beautiful thing about, and I won't quote her exactly, but, you know, when like love is not enough and like romance is not enough and like the excitement of things is not enough like you know you are a person who comes from people (laughs) and how does that inform your life and how you interact with those people and other people so I don't think it's reductive to like what you just said I think 
that's exactly it. That's what we tried for, you know, and how there are things bigger than us and, and things within us that affect things bigger than us. And I think, I hope people feel that. So I'm glad that that's what you felt. I'm, <laughs> that means maybe we did our job. Hopefully. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's actually a really good way out. Is there anything else you want to talk about or cover or anything? Is there something I should have asked you that I didn't some, some way to set it up? Oh, um, we can end on the setting up the, the screening. Okay, right? Yeah. But it, did I miss anything? Did I cover everything? So I, I never know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm just, um, yeah, I, I would say when I think about 10 things I hate about when people, ex, you know, people who know me expect me to make a movie. I think everyone was expecting a movie like 10 things I hate about you or the princess diaries and, you know, all of these kind of like feel good, sunny comedies and joyful movies. And, um, <clears throat> those are very much the movies that I escaped into, but this place is very much the movie that my world lives in. It's, it's more reflective of my actual life. And so I think I needed to get it out so I can make those other kinds of movies. I needed to face my own shit <laughs> yeah. to be able to make the dreamy, wonderful, fantastical movies that I hope to do. And so it is as much a part of me. It is the part of me that I think I was escaping from into those films like 10 things I hate about you and I'm excited for people to see this side of me because I think it's important to see the side of our lives you know all three of us as writers every Goshen and I but um, I'm hoping once I get this out of my system people might <laughs> be like so what do you want to do next you know I got that kind of like first time filmmaker here's my life okay let's move on kind of thing but um, I think both of them are both sides of me and I'm glad for people to see my interior versus what they know of me on my exterior yeah, it's absolutely the way it works, right? Like you, you can be this person because you get it out in the movie. Yeah, I, this comes up over and over and over again. Yeah, um, and I can end on an even happier note because <laughs> we are screening Ten Things I Hate About You at the Cinema Park Open Air Cinema in David Pico Square on Saturday, September seventeenth at ten p.m. So come introduce it with me if you're not, you know, doing your own thing. I would love to. I think we have a screening that night. What time is it? What did you say again? Ten p.m. I will be there. I'll come right after my screening to come introduce it. That would be the joy of my life. <laughs> oh, it would be my pleasure. Uh, and anybody Eat listening? In the theater. <laughs> yeah, come down, watch it with us. It'll be great. Thank you so much, Norm. Oh, my pleasure. I'll see you next Saturday. See you at the movies. <laughs> <laughs> my thanks to VT90, whose powerful first feature, This Place, has its world premiere this Friday, September 9th at 8.45 p.m. at the Scotiabank 3 at the Toronto International Film Festival. It's also available on digital.tiff.net in the Festival at Home series at 10 a.m. next Wednesday, September 14th. And there are additional in-person screenings Friday, September 16th at 6.30 p.m. at the TIFF Bell Lightbox 3, and on Saturday, September 17th at 7.35 at the Scotiabank 11. And if everything goes as planned, Niney will be joining me after that last screening to introduce 10 Things I Hate About You at Cinema Park in David Pico Square, just west of Roy Thompson Hall. 10 p.m. start, Saturday the 17th. It's free. Come and join us. You can follow Niney on Twitter at underscore nine me. That's an underscore symbol, the numeral nine, and K-N-E-E -E all together. And you can find 10 Things I Hate About You on Blu-ray and DVD from Walt Disney Home Entertainment and streaming in 4K on Disney Plus in the U.S. and Canada. It's also available to rent or buy on various VOD platforms. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner, and you can find this podcast there at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at someoneelsesmovie.com. The first year of the show is still available for just 20 bucks at payhip.com slash semcast. That's the first 52 episodes of someone else's movie, 46 of which aren't currently available anywhere else. And check out my newsletter, Shiny Things, at shiny-things.ghost.io. I think you'll like it. Our theme song is by the last year. If you enjoyed it or the show in general, please say so. Leave a review wherever you've been listening. Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network while you're doing that. Stay safe. Watch movies. Wear a mask if you go out. Get your booster when you can. I'll see you at the film festival.